as Douglas Carswell just mentioned, um, I've written a number of books in recent years, in which I think this, I feel like this one is a sort of culmination of them in some ways, because pretty much all of my life I've grappled with one particular problem in the realm of, of politics, which is um, the issue of self-hatred that has been going on in the West in, I think, throughout my lifetime. Uh, I'm now in my 40s, and uh, it's been a sort of consistent theme in, in a lot of my writing. Um, some years ago, I wrote a book on immigration called The Strange Death of Europe. And um, in that question, I, I looked into the, the issue of immigration, not just in Europe, uh, specifically then the migrant crisis that was going on in 2015, which I witnessed close up, but what the situation is in immigration in all of the developed world. Um, it's an extraordinary thing, but you know the, the developed world obviously uh, attracts people from the developing world who want to come because they're fleeing war sometimes, more often are fleeing economic deprivation. And yet at the same time that the world is demonstrating it wants to come to, particularly the West, um, the West has been doing this very strange thing to itself in effectively debasing itself, destroying itself, I'd argue, um, almost as part of the same process. People uh, increasingly in Europe and in Britain were were against borders, I noticed, as if, as if borders were the problem. And some politicians even said this, that the borders were the problem and that migration was the answer. And I thought that was a very curious thing for any society to start to think. Anyhow, I, I addressed that issue of immigration, assuming that I was going to end my career. And, um, and then I found out, I woke up one day and realized I was still here. Um, so I thought, well, maybe I'll find the remaining taboos of my time and jump all over them and see if I survive. And so I did, and I wrote a book called The Madness of Crowds, uh, which came out a few years ago and addressed what I say are the strange things that have been going on in, in Western societies, particularly in America. The odd way in which, for instance, um, identifying as part of a nation state has become more and more unacceptable, or we're told it's unacceptable, whereas to identify by some other grouping is what you're meant to do, you know. You're meant to identify by your sex, you know, if you're a woman. Um, you're meant to identify by your sexual orientation, if you're gay. You're meant to identify by your race, as long as you're not white. And I saw this strange way in which America in particular was sort of fracturing into these interest groups, effectively, so that politicians were talking about voters, not, not as Americans or left or right, but by these interest groups. You know, we want to appeal to this particular group. And I thought that was very strange, and in some of those cases, very new. Um, and I also noticed then that there was a strange, um, strange politicization to all of these issues, so that you know, a distinguished feminist, for instance, was no longer a feminist if she stopped being left-wing. You know? I thought, this is very strange. Um, when Kanye West came out for the Re Republicans, uh, he was denounced in the Atlantic magazine as no longer black. You know, it's very strange, very strange rule, this. When Peter Thiel came out for Donald Trump, the main gay magazine in New York said that Peter Thiel wasn't gay any longer. It's a very, very strange set of sort of ideas that were being pushed onto everyone. But, so I was sort of going through that in the madness of crowds, and then in the last couple of years in particular, I, I sort of felt like I was getting to the point I was trying to make and putting my finger on it. And I particularly felt this in the... Uh, summer of 2020, the uh, post-George Floyd period in America. Because in my mind, something very curious happened. Uh, as you all know, uh, in that period, the original part of the coronavirus era, um, people were, were told to stay in their houses. And we've all litigated and debated the wisdom of that and much more, and it was different from state to state and country to country. But broadly speaking, in the run-up to those events, we had been forced into solitude by government, by, by the authorities. And one of the things about this that has not been commented upon very much is if you're forced into isolation, you lose, among other things, your social antennae. You know, um, in normal times, if somebody says something about you or about your society, you know, you, you see friends that evening, you go to a bar, and you say, what do you think about this? You know, and you, you can have ideas out, and, and you can get a good sense of what people are actually feeling. And the post-George Floyd moment in America, I thought, was very, very worrying. Because we didn't have our social antennae. 
And around the world, I happened to be in the UK at that point. I live in America now, but I happened to be in the UK at that point. Um, we went in no seconds flat from stay at home because the coronavirus is the problem to go out on the streets and protest in large crowds because racism is a problem. And I thought that is a, first of, all, first of all, that is a very strange, I mean, you can get whiplash from that. And some of us did. Um, there were medical professionals, hundreds of medical professionals in America who signed a letter having told us all to stay in our homes, not to see our loved ones, not to see relatives when they were dying, not to have proper funerals for people, and much, much more, not to celebrate the normal passages of life. We were told not to do these things. And then suddenly hundreds of American healthcare professionals said, racism is the virus, you need to get out onto the streets. And I thought this was very troubling for lots of reasons, one of which was, as I say, we'd lost our antennae. And so an aversion of America was not just played out in America, but played out across the world, which I, at any rate, instinctively felt was totally untrue. Um, now, one of the things that, that, that happened in that period was, of course, it's the nature of mass information in this age, one terrible, appalling thing can be blown up in such a way that it gives a completely distorted view of a society. But if your society at that point is, not, is totally fractured into individuals having to sit in their homes, you can doubt that. Even I did for a time. I had a moment thinking, are you allowed to do that in America? Do people do that? Well, of course, the answer is no. This is highly, highly uncommon thing that happened, an appalling thing, but it, it wasn't America. This, this, was, this didn't represent the nation. And yet, in, immediately, the American public square and the wider international public square was filled with people saying, no, this is absolutely typical of America. First of all, they started off with, this is characteristic police behavior in America. Then it was, this is because of American society, institutional racism, endemic racism. Then it was, this is actually not just the case with the US, but with the UK and all other Western countries as well. This is a, this is a Western problem. And I thought that this was a massive, massive uh, misrepresentation. And the way I started to think of it was, you know, because I, I was very interested in recent years, every single time there was any terrible interaction between the American police and anyone who was unarmed and black, Everybody in America fought over every detail of it, you know, and, and as an outsider, I sometimes thought, why do they fight so hard over every detail? And in the summer of 2020, I was asked by a friend in New York if I wanted to meet a very famous comedian whose name I won't give away in case I self-cancel myself. Um, <laughs> but, um, and I said, yeah, of course, I'd love to. And uh, we, we met up, and the entire conversation consisted of a discussion about the ballistics report into the death of Breonna Taylor. And I remember thinking, well, among other things, I thought you were a lot funnier on screen. But anyway, um, <laughs> but I thought this is totally normal in America now for, for everybody to obsess over these specific things. I thought, why do we obsess over them so much? And the answer is because in America it matters. Because in America it matters. And I started to think this is like in America, it's like uh, one of those old projection machines. You know, you, if you, get the, you have to get the details right down here because once you put a light behind it and project this up onto a wall, if one of these details is out of place, the projection on the wall is completely distorted. I think that's what's happened in America in recent years. I think we've fought over the details, Americans have fought over the details, in the knowledge that getting the details right in America matters. With no disrespect to my country of birth, in Britain it matters quite a bit. In some other countries, like Belgium, it wouldn't matter at all. But in, in America, it really matters. America's most important country, not only in the West, but in the world. So, so when these misrepresentations of America start to happen, you see that the whole projection of America on the wall of the world changes. Now, the actual immediate implications of this are uh, actually provable. I give the example in the war in the West of a poll that was carried out in 2020, uh, sorry, 2021, asking Americans how many unarmed black um, Americans they believe are killed every year by the American police. Among people who identified as liberal, a significant chunk, around 40%, said they thought that the figure was somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000. Among people who identified as very liberal, 
they thought that the number was over 10,000. Over 10,000 unarmed black people being killed every year in the US by the police. The figure in the, quest the year in question was 10. So this showed demonstrably that a significant chunk of America is off by several orders of magnitude about one of the most terrible things going on. The year after that, the figure was six. And by the way, I should mention, put this in context, um, t that figure of 10, more American policemen were killed by armed black men that year than 10. And actually, if you want to know, I mean, one of the ironies I said this to Douglas Carswell earlier, of that figure of 10,000 is that 10,000 is actually the number of, of black Americans killed by other black Americans in that year. And I, I just, I think it's astonishing that this, this version of America has been projected, which, which we can now prove includes Americans who have a misunderstanding of the country they live in at the most fundamental, practical, everyday levels. Now, this has other consequences as well, which I go into in the book. One of those consequences is, if you fall for this interpretation of American society as being forced upon America, within America, by other Americans, um, absolutely everything in America gets looked at in a different light. Now, I was reading the other day um, the British historian Paul Johnson's History of the American Peoples. And the opening line of this book is, he says, I'm going to slightly misquote it, but he says something like, the opening line is, the history of the American people is the greatest history in the world. Now, I read that the other day. I thought, that was only published in 2000. Can you imagine somebody, a popular mainstream historian, opening with that line today? They would be crucified for it. How, what do you mean? How dare you say that? Why? Because everything in the past, in America and the wider West, has also been played through this same incredibly negative, hostile lens. Everybody in the past is now held to the standards of 2022. Um, and by the way, this same thing happens in the UK. Um, our greatest national hero, Winston Churchill, has also gone through a toppling process in recent years. Now, whenever his name is published by the BBC, they link to an article which says the 10 worst crimes of Winston Churchill. One of the crimes was that he had some Victorian attitudes about race. Well, he was born in Victorian England, so it's not that much of a surprise. Uh, but we saw in the summer of 2020, when the iconoclasm burst out in America, we saw the same thing happening in the UK. And Churchill's statue in Parliament Square was repeatedly attacked and eventually was boxed up in an iron box so that it wouldn't be pulled down. And as I discovered at that point, when, when I was debating with people who were very, very hostile about Churchill, I kept thinking, why would you come for Churchill? And one of the reasons this question kept coming to my mind was, first of all, why, do you, why can you put nothing in context, you know? Okay, you think he did this thing in 1911 where one miner died in a police response in Wales. On the other hand, he saved the world from Nazism. You know, so surely that's got to count for something. Um, he once said this thing that I don't approve of in 2022. Again, work out the ledger, please. Um, but I was repeatedly thinking, well, why would they come for Churchill? And one of the answers I came to was, because if you want to attack Britishness, you have to attack Winston Churchill. Because that's one of the places where our sense of pride, purpose, what our parents and grandparents fought for, died for, is the, the, per, well, the, the person who represents this. Um, well, a similar process, a much bigger, much much worse process has been going on in America. Um, as I show in the War on the West, absolutely everything in American history has now been run through an entirely negative lens. And the negative lens always relies on the following things. Racism, and connections with slavery. And in the case of the UK, of course, you have the added issue of empire. Um, and something very strange has happened. Uh, first of all, you have movements like the 1619 project of the New York Times. I, I, I write about this project in, in, in the book a bit. And there's 
and then this project has been torn apart by other people, but it was a pleasure to do it again. Um, I mean, the 1619 project says, said that its aim was to rewrite the founding date of America so that it was clearer, this is the words of the authors, that America was born into the sin of slavery, that slavery is the foundational element in American life. By the way, the authors also, um, I mean, they did hit jobs on everything, including, by the way, one that hasn't had enough attention uh, was um, American capitalism. Um, I, should, um, I should tell you that I have some fun with this because the New York Times commissioned a completely illiterate uh, sociologist to basically attack American capitalism by saying that it was connected to the plantations. Um, he said, uh, in particular, he says, this is the New York Times doing this, um, that when people sit down in their, at their desks in America in the morning, uh, they are using things like tracked, recorded, and analyzed vertical reporting systems, double entry record keeping, and precise quantification. Many of these techniques that we now take for granted were developed by and for large plantations. Um, as I say, um, could there be any reason why a system in which things are, quote, tracked, recorded, and analyzed might work better than a system in which things are, for instance, lost, ignored, and forgotten about? Um, the point is that everything, by the way, part of the illiteracy of that claim, of course, is the plantation system was nothing to do with capitalism. It was a feudal system. It had nothing to do with capitalism. But the 1619 Project, the New York Times, which is no small thing, aimed to rewrite everything in America in this completely negative light. And then, bit by bit, we saw this same thing go through everything in American history. Uh, we saw it, first of all, statues of southern generals and others, and people were very confused and conflicted about that. And I said at the time, we have a debate about all of that, but I, I, I wrote this in the New York Post, where I come. I said, I said, does anyone know where the stop button is on this thing? And in absolutely no time, we discovered nobody did. Um, because that same iconoclastic movement, of course, went for Columbus again, on, again, the presumption that it would have been better if Columbus had not discovered the Americas, and that he should either have gone back home and stayed silent, or gone back home and said, I have discovered a large piece of real estate, but it doesn't have any potential. You know, I mean, the attacks on Columbus are so strange um, and comprehensive now that, as I mean, dozens and dozens of representations of Columbus have come down, of course. Um, then we get on to the Founding Fathers. You know, we get to the point in 2020, in the summer of 2020, where, where when then-President Trump gives his speech at Mount Rushmore, the CNN correspondent says the president is going to kick off Independence Day weekend this weekend by standing in front of an image of two slavers on standing on stolen land. I thought, if you've decided that Mount Rushmore is stolen land and your founders are just slavers, nothing else to be said about them, then what exactly is left of this republic? What are you, what are you talking about? Um, and so it moved on to the founding fathers. This very strange thing. Thomas Jefferson, completely rewritten. One aspect of Jefferson's life that was maybe not that well known about 100 years ago becomes the only thing that any school child knows. Um, and in the city where I live, in New York, again, this had consequences just last year. Thomas Jefferson's statue is voted to be removed by the council. They pull him down, crate him up, and wheel him through a back door. And one of the members of the New York council said, well, of course, because Thomas Jefferson doesn't represent our values. Well, anyway, um, you move forward, you get to the Civil War, you get, of course, the criticisms of the South, but you also get the same criticisms of the North. You have one of the most admired figures in American history, Lincoln, there used to be some unity about, um, it portrayed in the same light. I was in Portland, Oregon, the morning after they pulled down, the mob pulled down the statue of Lincoln there. And a few months later, the authorities in Boston didn't even have to wait for the mob. They took down their statue of Lincoln before the mob got to it. Um, and then I came back to this same thing I was thinking in the case of Britain. Well, 
why would you come for Abraham Lincoln? I mean, I was speaking to one of his biographers recently, and aside from his extraordinary um, success as president, um, I mean, that story of Lincoln is one of the great American success stories. I mean, as this biographer of his said to me, Abraham Lincoln was basically born in the Iron Age. I mean, they had nothing, nothing. You know, Abraham Lincoln had maybe one year's formal education in his entire life. The rest was all self-taught, all self-taught. And, and he rose to the highest position in the land. So this is one of, by any standards, this is one of the great American stories. It's a story of heroism. It's a story of achievement. It's a story of pulling yourself up and making something of your life. So I came back to the same thing I had with Churchill was, of course you have to come for the Founding Fathers. Of course you have to come for Lincoln. You have to come for Roosevelt. You have to come for absolutely everybody. Even come for Martin Luther King now, who's also deemed not to be up to scratch by the standards of the 2020s. You've got to come for absolutely everybody because then we lose our story. Then Americans lose the right to their own story. They're told, first of all, your history is terrible. And then you have no right to feel any pride in it because there's nothing good in it. Now, this remorseless lens, I should say, is not used by any society other than Western societies on itself. This is a very strange thing going on in the modern West. You know, most peoples want to think well of themselves. All societies have something good to be said about themselves. Only today in the modern West do we allow ourselves to be talked about in this extraordinary, relentless, hostile light. And I was doing a, in another interview last night, and a, a journalist said to me, well, you know, isn't part of the point of history, you know, that things get rewritten and reapproached? And we're always, you know... And I said, sure. As I say in the book, I, I don't want to stop any debate. I enjoy it. I think we can always benefit from it, and sometimes we can laugh at it. But, but and this interviewer said, well, well, what are you against? And I said, I'm, I'm against people who are entirely negative and hostile about the society of critics. And this, the interviewer said, well, how can you tell the difference? And I said to him, well, it was a radio interview. I said, you know, you can tell it in your life. I can tell it in my life. I said to him, if, if I said to you, now, look, you're, you're no good as a radio presenter. Well, no, if I, I said to him first, I said, if I said to you, look, you're a great presenter, um, but there's this thing you could do to be better. You might listen to me. You might not. You don't have to. But if I said to you, you're no good as a radio presenter. In fact, you're terrible. Um, you've got a face for radio, but you don't have a voice for radio. Um, you don't seem to know anything, and everyone hates you. And, and much, much... If I just went along like this, I said, would you say, what an interesting critic? <laughs> Or would you say, this guy really doesn't seem to like me, and I'm going to try to ignore what he says? Well, I think it's the same thing with nations. I think if somebody says, and it always is the case, there are things you can improve in your society, then we listen. I mean, America in particular listens to that. Western democracies are very good at listening to criticism. That's how we've developed, how our opinions have changed, how societal norms change. We listen. We're interested. But if somebody says, there's just nothing good about you, you know, you've been rotten from the start, you're not dealing with a critic, you're dealing with an opponent. And, you know, I, I, I try to put, I try in The War in the West to add the context which nothing in our time seems to have. You know, I, I make the point that, you know, none of this is whataboutery, which is one of the left's claims. I make the point that, for instance, at the time that America was involved in slavery, Everybody in the world was involved in slavery. Every civilization in history had had slavery of some kind. You know, if we're going to pull down things created by slavery, you better get going on the pyramids in Egypt. Uh, people who built those weren't paid a fair day's wage for a fair day's labor. Um, you know, the Parthenon in Athens wasn't built by Alcibiades. It was built by slavery. Um, you've got to pull that down. You know, America was normal at the time for this. By the way, I mention in, 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 the, uh, in the War on the West that uh, this isn't to diminish the transatlantic slave trade, but the transatlantic slave trade saw perhaps 12 million people taken across the Atlantic, most to America. I always 
remind, not, most not to America, so I, I have to remind people. I mean, the Brazilian slave trade continued until the 1880s. Um, but at the same time, 18 million, one eight million people were taken from Africa and sold into slavery in the Arab countries. Why do we not know anything about this? Why does nobody mention this? Well, among other things, because all 18 million of them uh, were deliberately made sure there would be no future generation. The Arabs castrated all of the males, so there would be no more um, black Africans in the Arabian Peninsula. That has a consequence to this day, by the way. I have a great friend who was born in Somalia who spent part of her upbringing in Saudi Arabia. And she was the first person to alert me to the fact that in, in Saudi Arabia and other countries in the Middle East today, the word for a black um, person is abid, or abid in the plural, which is slave. Literally, the word they use in the Arab countries for black people is slave. Um, and one of the things I think that is coming to us through this strange period of self-hatred of ourselves is an inability to look around the rest of the world. We are so busy tearing at closed wounds in our own societies that I wonder whether we even have the interest in looking around the rest of the world today. You know, there are 40 million, 40 million slaves in the world today. That is more slaves than there were in the world in the 19th century. And if we could just get the past in America and the rest of the West into some perspective, we might do something about that. You know, uh, whilst we talk about racism in America and endlessly tear over, you know, six or ten bad police interactions with black Americans in a year, one million Chinese Muslims are in concentration camps as I speak. Might we get some of this into some perspective? It seems to me that getting that into some perspective is absolutely crucial. You know, and I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to you shortly, but in the 21st century, there is, there is only one power in the world likely to overtake America as the world's foremost economy, and that's China, run by the Co Chinese Communist Party. And uh, I, of, I often try to find, it goes back to what Carl said earlier about young people and trying to make sure that some of these ideas get to them. I often try to like put in a nutshell what what you should say to various critics, indeed haters of America and the West. And one of the things I often say to people is, you know, people who complain about the appallingness of our own societies, how well, we're terrible, we're racist, we're this, we're that. I would say, you know, if you, if, if you didn't like the American period of power, you're going to love the Chinese communist one. <laughs> you know, do take your, your human rights uh, complaints to the Chinese Communist Party and see what they say. You know, and in a way, th this is important to bear in mind because, again, it comes back to this thing, that the things that we attack ourselves on are so often our virtues. You know, the late Daniel Patrick Moynihan once said that in his time at the United Nations in New York, and then not the happiest job for anyone to, uh, to have, um, he's, Daniel Patrick Moynihan said that one of the things he realized was that Claims of human rights violations could almost always be said to be in exactly inverse proportion to the number of human rights violations. I'll explain what he meant. A country in which you hear endless talk about human rights violations is likely to be a country that is concerned about that. Whereas countries in which you never hear about that is because they don't care. Now, there's a follow-on problem for that, which young people in particular, in particular can fall into, which is the mistaken assumption, therefore, that the societies in which human rights violations are most commonly said to occur, a young person might think, are indeed the worst countries. That, I would submit, is one of the things that young Americans have been told in recent years, have been persuaded into, that the country they hear the most about is, in fact, not the best, but the worst. And just to finish before this, I, I say in, uh, in the book that you know, there are some very practical things people can do to turn this around. I've taken enormous inspiration in the last year or so from the action that American parents have taken. You know, American parents who discovered, apart from anything else during COVID, what their kids were being taught. And you know, they didn't wait for a political leader to come along and tell them you know, what to think or anything. They, you know, they needed support, but this was just Americans rising up and saying, no, you don't get to do this. And there's an enormous amount 
that can be achieved by exactly that. There's a lot of very practical and good things that are happening here in America. But the second thing, and it's one of the things I sort of close on in the book, is that we have to find a way to turn around this society in which resentment has become key. And I say resentment because, as I say, resentment is one of the deep, deep human emotions. Uh, and we can all have it. We all fall prey to it at some point. Uh, and some people, as we all know, get stuck in it. And this is nothing to do with racial. It's not, nothing religious. It's, nothing, it's not even by socioeconomic class. Who doesn't know somebody who's got almost nothing materially but is somebody filled with gratitude and love? And, and equally, who doesn't know somebody who seems to have a lot and is filled with resentment about not having more or somebody did them down once? My point is, is that yeah, that's a very fundamental human emotion, resentment. And you can be encouraged into it. You can be encouraged into being a resentful person. Well, it's the same thing with a society. A society can be encouraged into being a resentful society. You don't have everything you want, and somebody else is to blame. Not everything in the past was exactly to your liking, so tear down the past. Somebody in history 200 years ago had a wrong done to them, and you're going to assume that wrong unto yourself. You're going to tear at a closed wound and then cry about the pain that's been caused to you. you know, that, that, that is a perfectly possible human emotion, and we, uh, we can be encouraged as individuals and as a society into it. But the opposite is also possible. The only thing that cancels out resentment in your life and as a country is gratitude. Gratitude is the only deep answer to the resentful person. There is, by the way, Nietzsche says this, but there is, a, there is one very unpleasant thing you can do to a resentful person, which is not very popular, but I'll tell you what it is, by the way, is to say, you're right. There is somebody who's destroyed your life. There is somebody who's held you back. There is somebody who's stopped you getting forward. The person's you. The problem is nobody wants to hear that. But it's, it's necessary at times. But other than that direct intervention, the most important thing you can do is to turn your life around into gratitude. And that's the thing that I think we need to try to encourage a new generation of Americans and other people in the West to have. Not why was everything in the past not directly in line with what I believe and want in my life now, but what, what was good that has allowed me the things I've had, I have now that are good? And as I say towards the end of the war in the West, we know that there must be something good about the West. And the world knows there must be something good about the West. Because the number one destination in the world that people want to come to is America. And there's a bit of a gap after that, but numbers two, three, and four are Britain, Canada, and, and uh, somewhere else in Europe, I can't remember where. Uh, the point is, is that if, um, as, as I thought when I was covering the migration crisis in 2015, the boats came in only one direction. The boats co were coming into Europe from North Africa and the Middle East. Boats heading off from North Africa to the southern shores of Europe do not meet boats coming the other way. They don't meet French people and Italians trying to flee Tuscany and make it to North Africa. You know, they, and it's the same in America. The millions of illegal migrants who come over the border every year is a massive challenge for this country. But those migrants walking north, breaking into America, do not meet people going the other way. They do not meet millions of Texans desperate to make it to Venezuela. Okay, there's a reason. And one of the reasons I submit, I say in the book is, that's because the world recognizes that the West has done something right, and they want to be part of it. And my suggestion to the people of the West is to recognize, first of all, that fact, that the, that the footfall tells us something. The footfall tells us something, and secondly, to recognize that if you've got something good now, which we have, it's not sheer chance. It's because you did something right in the past. If you're good in the present, it means something must be good about you in the past. Now, people around the world know that. Part of my hope, part of my aim with this book, is to make sure the peoples of the West know that too. Anyway, thank you.
time for some questions. Oh, some questions. I will, um, who would like to... Hey, that was a great speech. Um, I want to get your thoughts on the Biden administration's new Ministry of Truth, or I'm sorry, Disinformation and Governance Board. And um, if you see any hope in the future of us coming out of this woke cancel culture that we're being dragged into. Mm. Yes, I'm sure you're all familiar with the new Ministry of Truth being set up by the Department of Homeland Security, which isn't at all an example of government overreach. Um, <laughs> it's amazing. Isn't it fantastic that the, um, the lady who they wanted to appoint um, herself seems to have got absolutely everything wrong? Uh, she claimed that the Hunter Biden laptop story was uh, disinformation. So if your disinformation czar believes that a story that's true is disinformation. It seems to me she's not greatly qualified for the role. Um, and by the way, that, that, that is a very sinister one. I mean, you know, I, I actually just, I write a column for New York Post, I'm writing it today, but I was saying in that that, you know, we have the answer to these problems already in America. It's called the First Amendment. The First Amendment allows you to argue things out, not in the idea that you just have a noisy cacophony, but in the fact that you get to the truth. The minute you uh, appoint people who decide what Americans can hear as well as what they can say, uh, you don't have that situation. You have to rely on your... Um, I said this on Fox the other morning. I wouldn't trust myself to be the disinformation czar. I wouldn't. Because nobody could perform that role. I couldn't perform it. This stuff is litigated in the public square by the American press and free media arguing things over, politicians arguing things over, the American public arguing things over, that's the only answer. But I mean, who would you appoint to tell you what you're allowed to read in advance of an election? I mean, you know, we saw, actually, with, again, with the New York Post story, we saw that the people the tech companies appoint, they're totally unsuited for the task. They don't know what they're doing. So it, that, it worries me immensely. As for the, um, the, the question of the, the council culture, I'm very positive about this long-term as I say, I think in the short term we're in for a rocky old time. But uh, in, the, in, in the long term, I think it's going to be okay. And already there are some signs of, of it being okay. We were, as I was discussing with Cal at dinner last night, that um, I have an analogy for what cancel culture is, which some people in this audience will, will recognize it. Um, if you've ever seen a sheepdog trying to herd a flock of sheep, um, you'll know that there it doesn't run straight into the middle of the pack. You know, it doesn't, doesn't run straight. It, it runs to the edges of the herd and it nips at them. Well, that's what the council culture people are trying to do and have been doing in recent years. They find people on the edges of the herd and they nip at them in order that the rest of the herd says, oh gosh, you know, I'm gonna have to go this way. And the radical left in America has been really effective at that. You know, they, they call people right wing who are libertarians, they call people far right who are leftists. They, they smear everyone, you know, most recently, by the way, and with some consequences, what they've been saying about Dave Chappelle. And they get one of America's most talented and brilliant comedians, and they defame him until, I, of course, somebody's going to take a run at him on stage at some point, because you've said this guy is a danger, because, because words are violence, but violence isn't violence, you know. And... Um, but they've been doing these horrible attempts to take out my friend Joe Rogan, who I saw a couple of weeks ago in Austin. I said this to him on his podcast. You know, they really came for him to take him out. They caught this every single trick in the book. And I said to him, you know, well done for surviving. And he said, well, it helped that the people leading the charge with CNN because no one believes them. Um, but, but, you know, these people they tried to take out, they've actually, there are now people, they're surviving. They're, and they're more than surviving, like Joe. They, are really thriving. So I'm hoping that if you identify that that's what's happening, that we're being nipped at the edges to behave in a certain way, the thing to do to avoid that is, is don't allow them to take anyone out by those means. You know? And in particular, stand up for your friends and the people you know and you like when that's tried on them. You know, it's one of the absolute cardinal rules. I think we can get through that. Um, there are some strategic things you could do, one of which is to try to nip at them in turn. But um, but in general, yeah, I, I, I have this, this instinct that it'll, it'll, it'll be okay after a few more kind of rough years. But the, the rough years include people not giving up things they know to be true and not conceding to things they know to be lies. You know, I'm absolutely, 
don't be demoralized into saying yes when you know that that's not true. You know. Kim. You might have to shout. <laughs> So the elephant in the room is that there's something, right? But there's no one in this room that looks like me, right? So how do we get to the point where we can have those conversations where you're not just surrounded by people who look like you mm -hmm. or who are going to agree with you? How do we get to a comfortable space? Not that it won't be it make us uneasy, but how do we get to a space where we can have those conversations with each other and you not feel canceled or my parents who fought in the March. Mm -hmm. How can we say that two things can be bad? Like we are capable of saying that there are multiple things that have happened and they saw and it, it occurred. Um, but I'm not carrying my parents' burden, right? Mm -hmm. But I can acknowledge their burden and what they went through because my mother's very much so <coughs> How do we get to that point where we can have those conversations and people not threaten each other mm -hmm. or me not be the only black person? Yeah, yeah. It's a very good question. Um, I mean, you know, the f first thing is, I mean, uh, I speak all over the place and uh, all sorts of audiences and very diverse and, you know, um, travel all over this country. And as I was saying at lunch, always go in particular anywhere I haven't already been, you know. Um, and I, as, as for the, the how you have a proper discussion on it, I mean, I think there's several things. I mean, one is you is to not allow bad actors into the space, uh, bad faith actors. And I think that that has been something which has happened recently. Let me give you a quick example. One of the people I, I critique, particularly in the opening of The War in the West, is this um, person called Robin DiAngelo, who wrote a book called White Fragility. You probably know. I mean, it's, I actually had to read the book. I mean, lots of people bought it, but I actually had to read it. Um, and uh, uh, DiAngelo is a real piece of work, because she, she's white herself, of course. And she just makes assertions that are totally untrue. I mean, she was interviewed uh, um, uh, on one of the networks um, by a female journalist a couple of years ago who said to her, um, you know, you say that, um, and she, she put one of D'Angelo's crazily like, racist actually, sort of statements to D'Angelo and said, what evidence do you have for this? And D'Angelo's response was, I think, she said, I think there's a type of glee among white Americans when black bodies are punished. So she answered one unproved assertion by making another even wilder unprovable assertion. Um, and nobody sort of pick, picked her up on this. And in fact, D'Angelo will not, I, I, Jordan Peterson and I had offered um, money to debate D'Angelo, money to go to a charity. So come out and debate your ideas. You're meant to be a public intellectual. Public intellectuals go out into the public arena and they, they argue. She will not debate anyone. Same thing with Ibram X. Kendi, who's one of the other big figures of the era. He will not debate his own ideas. So I think that's a problem. You know, I always say, I, I've, I've debated all kinds of people in my life, you know, and I think it's part of your job as a public intellectual to do that whenever you're asked, whenever you can. Um, but I am very struck by the fact that the people making the most radical assertions about America today will not debate them. And that is a very negative development. That did not used to be the case, you know. I, in your mother's generation, I guess it held years, but that was not the case with prominent American black intellectuals, for instance. I mean, they, goodness knows, they knew how to argue in public and have their ideas out and, and be challenged and challenged in return, you know. It's impossible not to see something like James Baldwin's debates, like his debate against William F. Buckley, and not, I mean, just be... You know, that wasn't somebody who was afraid about debating his ideas, you know? But this, there's, there is a new generation of people forcing much, much more radical ideas, much more radical ideas, on the American public who will not discuss them. I always go wherever I'm asked, uh, you know, to, to talk about my ideas, and I always say, whenever I speak at a university, for instance, you know, I always say, I, I'm here for as long as you've got, you know? answer as many questions as you have, because I think that's part of the fun of it. But I am really struck by an, an unwillingness now to engage in ideas. But So, I mean, any time you can find me anyone who's actually willing to, you know, do a, a debate, a different audience in a different place, I'm there.
put my own ticket. I saw a hand up over there. Uh, hey Douglas, hey. Uh, I, uh, I uh, really enjoyed your speech and I loved your book. Uh, in it, uh, in it, I noticed you, you very uh, uh, several times you you would differentiate between good faith arguments and bad faith mm -hmm. arguments from the left. Uh, uh, I I guess my question is, you know, if you look back in the past, uh, uh, conservatives. Uh, and people on the right have sometimes just been a bit reflexive against the left. Uh, and, uh, you know, the William F. Buckley quote about history and yelling stop comes to mind. Uh, how do conservatives and freedom minded people uh, uh, fight the war on the West without uh, just falling into the trap of becoming a reflexive against? Uh, the everything the left. Mm. That's a very good question, actually, because it's um, it, actually, it's slightly linked to the previous one. Because there is a big temptation always in political life and cultural battles and so on um, to do back to your opponents what you think they've done to you. You know, and there's a big you know there's a, a, a big issue in that. The Ron DeSantis bill is an exa example. I think the DeSantis what he did was smart and and. I think that if a company makes wild political interventions and has protected status in a place, then, you know, okay, you're not any longer an entertainment company. You're some kind of weird political actor. And I, actually, I think that sort of action is totally reasonable. There is, a, there, is a, there is, however, a layer you can get to which is very dangerous, and it's a layer I've spoken about before which exists in all of our politics today, which is the desire not just to defeat your opponent, opponent but to hurt them. You know, and I worry about that because in the process of that, you do something which is likely to not only hurt your opponent but hurt you as well. You know, so, wh wh who, who, it, who famously said, uh, "When a man's willing to pick up any stick to beat an opponent, he might find that he's picked up a boomerang." Um, th there is a there is something that you destroy in yourself if you give up all principles, all rules. You know, you become the thing you think you're battling. Um, but I think that. I think that this is a challenge that conservatives are thinking about at the moment, is effectively, you know, do we fight fire with fire? If so, is there a limit to how we do it, or can we do it in a reasonable way? And there's a, there's a big debate on the American right in this. I just wanted to make one other point, as I say, it was related to the previous question as well, which is um, I think we have to be very, very careful in America in particular at the moment that we don't end up in this vengeance cycle. And I think it can happen politically, and I think it happens on the race issue as well. Um, the person I just referred to, Ibram X. Kendi, in his book, um, titled, I think, rather inaccurately, How to Be an Anti-Racist, says, um, the answer to past discrimination is present discrimination, and the answer to past injustice is present injustice. And this, this reminds me of something I wrote about in The Madness of Crowds. Uh, there was a, because I think this is something that's a temptation in all social movements, and it's particular in our day to do with racism. There are people like Kendi who say, because there, there were, it was undoubtedly the case that black Americans historically were prejudiced against, we should be prejudiced against white Americans today. It's almost as if you could, it's like a, an overcorrection. Let's, let's do that in order to get to normal. And one of the things I say is, in my observation, you never do get back to normal in that. If you overswing the pendulum, it doesn't reassert itself by some force of nature. You might have just sent the whole thing spinning off elsewhere. I give the example in my previous book, In the Madness of Crowds, on this with the worst fringes of the feminist movements. The best fringes of the feminist movements, or the best parts of the feminist movement, delivered right, you know, votes for women and much more. But there was a moment in third and fourth wave feminism where you got particularly um, strident American feminists who said things like, men are the problem. <laughs> like At that point, you get, what, what you're doing at that point is saying, because women didn't have the same opportunities as men historically, let's beat up on men now. Like, well, are you sure that's going to work? You know, are you sure you're going to win your battle by alienating 50% of the population? You know, um, and, and I think we have to really resist that temptation in America and in the West, that, that this idea that the, the, the response to past injustice is present-day injustice. You know, the, the response to past injustice for any group is present-day equality. That's it. 
think we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, did anyone, I saw a hand up at that table over there. Yes, sir. I had more of a, kind of an observation to see what your thoughts were, but one thing that comes to mind that emblemizes the era is the uh, image created by this Goya, Sleep Breeze and Give Birth to Demons. Mm -hmm. And looking at and working with <coughs> history and interpretation of history for decades, I've seen that what's been presented has been prior to all this PC stuff. It's been very naive. I noticed in your uh, early pages of War on the West, you have the image of the National Trust properties in Britain and how they were initially interpreted as uh, just. Uh, Remember, just facts, just beautiful things to see, but now they're being twisted into something used as a bludgeon. And there, in the earlier presentation, you don't see a real awareness but consists of a bigger picture mm -hmm. that would compel people. And, and in, in that void created by this, you've had these, the, uh, leftist marching in. Uh, and much of this being per perpetuated by the institutions, we'll say in the United States, uh, uh, preservation agencies that were created as a result of the uh, National Historic Preservation Act, 1966. They're just basically like the National Trust, creating neutral, mm. impotent symbols mm. of the past mm. that don't motivate anyone. And now, in that vacuum, comes the end of the... Yes, it, it, it's a great image, the, the sleep of reason. By the way, it's also, it's a very practical thing in our own day. I, 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 in the chapter on religion in, in this book, I talk about not only the attack on Judeo-Christian uh, values, but the attack on secular and enlightenment values of the kind that the American founding fathers were very familiar with. In recent years, every single enlightenment philosopher has been brought down, quite literally. Um, Voltaire, the great French secularist, his statues now disappeared in Paris. It was assaulted so many times the authorities removed it. Um, people used to credit Voltaire as being one of the most important figures in helping lead to the separation of church and state. Um, David Hume, who spent much of his life working to ensure, in, uh, make sure that rationalism became the basis of discourse, not clerical claims, uh, has had his name removed from buildings in his native Scotland because of you know, uh, things that are claimed about him in the past. Same thing with almost everybody, John Stuart Mill, all, all the people who gave us the modern understanding of rationalism and reason have one by one been torn down. And by the way, there's a consequence from that that comes from that. There's a consequence that comes from that, and we see it in a really practical way in America. Um, I, I, towards the end of the book, I talk about it, what, what is happening in teaching terms in America as a result of these, you know, 50,000 feet ideas, where, where, they hit the, where the rubber hits the road. Um, one of them you can see in the American teaching unions with, for instance, the claim in what's now called equitable maths, equitable math, that, um, that correct answers in maths are racist, and that, in, that the Western scientific method is racist. Why? Because they could say it was come up with by dead white men, which is actually also not true. Um, it's par partly true. Um, but all of these things now are said to be the products, again, of racism and much more. And this has results. I mean, it's the same thing as the claim that, for instance, um, we should do away with standardized testing, because standardized testing is racist. This is, by the way, Rand no less a figure than Randy Weingarten says this. Um, these claims are disastrous. Reason, the process of reason, testing, standardized testing, accuracy, and much more are the, way, are the best ways not only for society to work, they are also the best ways for any individual of any economic, uh, any racial background to get out of economic deprivation. The best way to work hard, to be tested, to prove yourself, to get up and out. These are the ladders that have been created in, in the West to get people out. And the attack on reason, the sleep of reason in the West, 
now includes this pretense that the things that are actually the best ladders in our society need to be brushed away, I think is disastrous. I'm going to come in with um, the last question of my own, if I may. Mm. Um, I think it's really important to always leave an event like this on an upbeat note. Mm. Um, your book is certainly an alarm call for America. You identify lots of things that have gone wrong throughout the West. But you are, first and foremost, I think, an optimist. Mm. Why? Yeah, it's, it's, it's true. I, I'm very glad you asked it tonight. I thought when you said I'm going to come in with a question, I thought Douglas Carswell was going to really come in for the kill. <laughs> um, no, I... Um, it's true. I would say short term, as I mentioned earlier, short term I think there's a lot, of, um, a lot of challenges in this country and in the wider West. But long term I think that it's, I think there's an enormous amount of optimism that we can have. And it is, it is that thing I said earlier. It's what, Douglas, you managed to achieve here with the CRT bill. It's, 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 what, it, it's what I mentioned in the, sort of the parents' revolt. I think there's this, this terrific thing in America in particular where you know, uh, I said this to Tucker Carlson a little while ago in an interview, you know, the, there's a moment in life when you realize that there's, the, the cavalry never comes, that you're the cavalry, you know, um, the cavalry is you. Um, and, and I think Americans are, are, are better than anyone else at realizing that. They're like, you're the cavalry that saves the day. You can't just sit around, <laughs> put your feet up, <laughs> and expect someone else to be, you know is that all of this gets solved by the American public making good decisions. And, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that issue of, you know, as it were, the luck we feel that we have in the West and some people don't know what to do with. At the end of the, quote, the, the book, I quote somebody who might be surprising, Branch Ricky once said a beautiful phrase I've become very fond of. He said, he said, luck is the residue of design. Luck is the residue of design. I love that phrase, is that, that what you have is not just luck. It's, it's that people have made good decisions in the past for you that have allowed you to be in the situation we're in today in a state like this. You know, people making good decisions before us is why we have the freedoms we have today. And if you accept that, then a very important mantle falls on your shoulders, which is then it's our job to make good decisions today for the people who come after. And as I say, I'm of the opinion that we don't wait around for any statesman to lead us to that position because the greatest person doesn't just turn up and, you know, wait for you to vote for them. It's, 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 it's the American public. And I have, I have developed, in the time I've been here and for many years before, I've developed a great trust that the American public will come to their own rescue. That's why I'm optimistic. Wonderful. Thank you.